Wild animals can undo a whole lot of our hard work, but they can also be a big help, and they're a real joy to have around. First, I'm going to show you how to avoid problems with wildlife and how to respond to them when you're farming and gardening in northwest Montana. And then Lisa's going to explore how to invite wildlife onto your farm and garden, how to make them safe, and also how to um, put them to work. And it'd be good if you could just hold on to your questions, and we're going to try to have some time afterwards for questions and answers. In northwest Montana, there are a lot of pesky critters that eat our crops, they eat our ornamentals, girdle our trees, and harm our animals, our pets, and um, their farm animals and pets. And if you ask for advice, often what you get is, here's how to do battle with these critters. Here's how to um, put out expensive repellent formulations. Here's how to kill them with herbs or pesticides or poisons or how to trap them or I could go after them with a shotgun. But I say the first thing we should do is take a whole different approach and first find out who is it that's um, causing the problem. You want to identify the culprit and learn as much as you can about them. But we don't often catch them in the act. So I'm going to start first with, with a species that's the most problem for me and where I farm in the north end of farm to market, and that's the white-tailed deer. And you probably already know how to tell their sign. Their, their hoof prints are pretty distinct, and the little piles of kind of long, longish um, oval pellets. But the other thing to watch for is um, if you look up close, you'll see that the, where they've been eating, it looks like it's ripped off. And you, you can remember that deer don't have any top teeth in the front. It's just like a bony plate. And so that's why they have to rip off the, um, the plant material. And they're after like the juicy green stuff in the spring. And as it goes throughout the year, they move towards shrubs because they're trying to get their gut ready for winter diets. So you'll see also that they shift their diets. They tend to mow something right down to the ground. Went the wrong way. Here we go. The, uh, easiest way to avoid deer problems is to not put out the buffet but um, that's not that easy I made a list of the species that in my experience of gardening here for 30 years these are species that deer don't bother you'll notice that most of the species on that list are really prickly or they're spiny or they're leathery or they just um, are strong smelling or they taste bad or they're poisonous so that's part of those characteristics are typically ones that deer don't go after. But most of our crops and our ornaments, they uh, are just plain tasty. So the first, you know, the most obvious defense and actually the best defense against wildlife getting into your crops is fencing. The rule of thumb is that whatever species you want to keep out, you want to make the fence be tall enough that they can't jump over it at a full run. So for deer, the recommended height is eight to nine feet. My garden fence is only six and a half feet tall, and I've never had a deer jump it. So I think that's good enough. I, you know, it's really going to be up to you what you find out. Um, the thing about like, this kind of fence is a um, woven wire fence, and I think these are super effective. They last a long time, but they require a lot of how you know know how and a lot of labor, and the um, there's a lot of special tools, and they're pretty expensive. A cheaper option is a welded wire fence, and you can even get like hog panels that are often like eight feet long. I think they're maybe four feet by eight feet, and you can stack them on top of each other. It's a whole lot easier to um, install. They are a lot cheaper. And this picture is in here to remind me to tell you that anytime you, if you have a garden that you're fencing to keep your deer out, always close the fence every time or the gate every time you walk out <laughs> because you'll have you can deer can get in your garden. And then they end up throwing their bodies against the fence to try to get out, and it's really horrible. They can they can be hurt very badly. It's, it's very traumatic for the people too. So just always close the gate, even if you think you're only going to be gone for a minute. I always close the gate behind me. If you have just single trees, it can work really well to just put a fence around those trees. So. Um, you just have to remember that it needs to be four or five feet high and big enough around that the deer can't put their faces through it to reach the plant. So if, you, if your fence has big mesh like this, it has to be further away from the plant because they're going to be able to stick their faces in and reach part way. If you live where deer live in the winter, you want it to be taller than four feet. Because mm -hmm. like, like this one. Yeah, where they can stand on the snow and still be able to reach it. There's another thing about deer that you can take advantage of is that they don't like to feel trapped. So they won't jump over a fence into a small area where they might feel trapped. 
and I have a raspberry patch. It's raspberry and asparagus, so there's great food in there for deer. Fence is only four feet tall, but I've never had a deer jump that fence, and it's because it's a real small patch, and supposedly it's because they will feel trapped in it. They'll walk right next to it and, and um, taste the flowers on the side of it, but they don't go in. So the next critter to think about when you're trying to identify who, who dug it is the rabbit. The big difference between rabbits and deer is that you know rabbits do have those front teeth, and so when they bite off, it's a real sharp cut, and it's almost always at an angle. So you can see this out in the woods too. You can tell if you have snowshoe hairs because that they'll leave the shrubs and trees that they munch on at a real sharp point. Their pellets also are like round, and they're usually a lot more scattered. Rabbits tend to just nibble here and nibble there. They don't just mow something down to the ground. Rabbit fencing, if you don't have deer around, rabbit fencing is totally different. It only has to be two feet tall, but you also have to dig down six inches to add um, protection from the burrowing rabbit. If you have deer and rabbit, <laughs> this works to have a larger mesh on the top, smaller mesh on the bottom. You always also have to bury it underground. But if you, what about all these critters that can climb over the fence? <laughs> so the recommendation for that is to have a floppy top on it that flops outside your garden. And so that way, if a um, critter, like a squirrel, is trying to get up, they have a hard time getting over this floppy top. So I like this illustration because it shows the floppy top, and then it shows the bigger mesh for deer, smaller mesh for rabbits, and then a buried part underneath. I would bury, the part that's buried underneath also needs to have a small hole. Remembering that critters like rabbits and mice can get into anything that's big enough for their skull. So unless they're really fat, which happens sometimes, but for the most part, you know, little mice can get through tiny holes as long as they can get their head in there. So for rabbits, I don't know, for, yeah, for rabbits, they'd recommend an inch. So squirrels can get right into my garden because I have a big mesh all the way down. I don't have rabbits, which is part of why we just have that mesh all the way down. And this is the thing they do that gets me the most annoyed is they bite my tomatoes or they steal them. And researching for this presentation, I learned that oftentimes they're just thirsty. And so this next year, I'm going to do a much better job at leaving water all the time in my garden so that they can get their needs met, so to get them some water. You can also try scaring them, and uh, which apparently works for squirrels a lot of times. I haven't tried it. But the thing about um, scaring is we're used to thinking that something needs to be as realistic as possible. So they'll sell you a super realistic scarecrow owl. They'll even sell ones that whose heads turn around. Some of them are battery operated. Um, they also have battery operated ones that will flap their wings. And you can imagine these are getting pretty expensive. But <laughs> this is probably, I'm sure this is as effective or more effective. And this is what I'm going to do this spring while it's still snowy. I'm going to build several of these just as a craft using leftover CDs. The thing is, if you exaggerate the eyes and things like that, and then take advantage of motion. So you'd want to put like a fishing swivel on something like this, make it out of like um, leftover pieces of foam or something so the rain won't destroy it. But um, just, you, you want to take advantage of motion. There's lots of ways to do that. You can buy commercial products that'll move around in the wind and exaggerate features like eyeballs, which is what the CDs here do. Um, and you also want to move things around in your garden. Every week, move stuff around. Some people swear by uh, soap and stinky soap and human hair and human urine, coyote urine. There's a lot of products you can buy. I've never had any success with these. And uh, supposedly they do work for a short time, but only in a real localized spot. And you have to protect them from rain. So you could put them up, you know, underneath the yogurt container or something if you wanted to use these but I gave up on them. There's also a dazzling array of repellents that you can buy. And these are, um, well, they're full of, uh, actually I have a couple notes on this. They're full of objectionable ingredients. They're stinky, a lot of them have peppers in them, which I always got in my eyes, and they also have a lot of chemicals that are often not safe for use on crops, just like, you know, if they happen to have um, lion poop on, in them or something, you, just, you don't want to get those on your crops. Some of them, like blood meal, actually attract bears and skunks and dogs. So they're some things you really don't want to use. And they are really expensive. After a lot of years of trying all kinds of stuff, I finally settled on what I call the easiest ever egg repellent. And the recipe is one egg and a blender full of water. And that's all it is. The handout has the um, 
instructions on how to do it. There's a couple tricks I learned over time to keep from clogging up the bottle and stuff. But it doesn't smell at all. You're not using rotten eggs, so you're not attracting any critters that you don't want. And deer just hate it. And you know, I have a few times seen a deer take a bite and then go, bah, bah, and then they'll walk off. It works great. It works for rabbits too. I love it. Dogs are also really good. To, this one's protecting his pear tree. As long as you have a well-behaved dog, you need a dog that's going to not chase the deer very far and maybe just get them out of your yard, but not chase them um, far and cause a problem and make a mess in your vegetables. So my dog doesn't help a bit when it comes to something like protecting berries because she likes to eat them herself. So what I started doing years ago, based on a recommendation in a book, was I started making strawberry rocks where you just take rocks of the right size and shape, spray paint them bright red, and um, you can use the same rocks year after year. You just put them out right before the berries turn red, and the robins will come along, and I've seen them do it too. They'll pack it, and then it's like, oh, these aren't any good, and then they leave your strawberries alone for the rest of the year. That worked great for years until we got crows in the neighborhood. I have a family of crows that lives nearby, and they're way too smart to be fooled by strawberry rocks. <laughs> so yeah. I started putting mesh netting over my strawberries, and that's worked great. <clears throat> for years as long as you it's really important that you um, hold down the edges with wood or rocks so that you don't get any birds trapped underneath it I'll get back to that if you have berries that have um, like blueberries that have the berries that are kind of bunched up you need to have your mesh kept the whole foot away from the berries so that the birds aren't um, grabbing the you know, reaching through and grabbing the berries but this is the real problem with mesh and Based on stuff I learned while researching to give this talk, I'm going to get rid of all of my plastic black mesh because it's too big and it can trap critters and they can die caught in your, nash, your mesh, especially if it's not pulled um, really taut. Um, the test is that it has to be quarter inch or smaller mesh and you don't want to be able to, they call it the finger test. If you push your finger through it, then a critter could go partway through it and get trapped. And that's especially true of little birds and reptiles and amphibians. Um, and also, as soon as your berries are ripe, get that mesh off and put it away. And that cuts down on the chance of them getting caught in it. The, the best trick, though, is to just harvest your berries every day, every other day at the very most. And you won't have nearly as many um, problems with both the um, birds and mammals or wasps. A lot of the birds that eat berries also eat insects, and I don't mind sharing them. So, you know, I like to, I don't mind at all. It's a little bit tougher when they come and wipe out my whole orchard, which has happened before with deer, with, uh, with squirrels. Um, because there are a lot of squirrels and a lot of different kinds of birds, and also deer just love to eat your apples. And there's some, some other kinds that do too. With deer, you can spray the low branches with that egg mix. That works really well. But I don't mind having deer in my garden, because, I mean, in my orchard, because they, they do keep the branch of the low branches trimmed off. And they also eat all the apples that fall on the ground before they're ripe and they keep it cleaned up. So I really actually like having the deer in the orchard. For the birds and the squirrels, one trick is to try to buy um, smaller varieties of trees, four varieties, and uh, or keep them pruned really short so that you're able to put mesh right over them. But again, it's really important to attach it under tight together on the trunk so, you, so that you don't get birds and squirrels that can get trapped inside there. You can also try a lot of scaring devices in your trees. Um, you can hang uh, shiny pie plates or CDs. You can buy um, a special flash tape or you can buy old or use old videotape. Just go to the second hand store and pick up some 25 cent videotape, old stuff, and hang it in your trees and that'll scare a lot of the critters away. Bears are their own special problem, and I'll have a whole special, whole separate section on bears here. But for now, I just want to say that it's really important to pick your fruit as soon as it's ripe for bears and for all the other critters. And uh, don't ever let it just lie on the ground. That causes a lot of other insect problems if you let your fruit just sit. Another problem with trees is caused by this critter. It's a kind of woodpecker called a sapsucker. There are several kinds of sapsuckers, actually. But they drill these holes in the bark, and the, the holes fill with sap, and the, the woodpeckers or the sapsuckers are eating the sap and all the insects that get caught in there. They can kill your trees. They introduce disease. They can be a real problem. 
but if you get to it soon enough, like this one right here, it's too late for that tree, it's, it's, a, it's dead. But um, if you can get to it early enough, you can spread Vaseline around the area. But sap suckers actually do a whole lot more good than harm. Lisa will talk about some really cool things that sap suckers do. So if you can put up with them, it's a really good idea to do it. They tend to only work on a small group of trees. Or like in my case, they killed one of our apple trees, but we had a couple other apple trees, so it was fine. It didn't bother me. I just let them have that tree until the tree was completely dead. So keep them around if you can. Another problem with trees caused by ungulates, they um, like to rub on them in the fall, and moose like to munch on them in the wintertime, hungry moose. And I, I don't think that's too hard to solve. There's a lot of different options for protecting and separating um, the, so for protecting the trees with some physical protection. I like the one that has the white background because it uh, spins around when bucks rub on it. It spins around so they don't get a good rubbing sensation that they're looking for and they'll leave your trees alone. Uh, I've been using that for years, and you can buy that locally. You can also buy a tape that wraps around. What's important is to watch your trees over the years. Like if you put these on, check them to make sure that you're not hurting your trees over time so that your tree isn't growing into the plastic or the metal. And also make sure that things aren't just decaying. Like the one on the right would just fall apart. These things are photo, um, they decay over time, and that would just probably fall apart if a buck tried to work on it. You can make your own pieces out of cut drain pipe too. That's pretty easy to fix. This one's harder to deal with. This is something that usually happens in the winter time, and these are voles that leave tiny little irregular teeth marks, and when the snow disappears, you'll find a lot of your trees are just girdled all the way around the tree, and the, like your little fruit trees or ornamental trees are dead. I want to make a point about the little, little animals that um, live in northwest Montana. We have a huge array, way more than these, of things that people think of as rodents, and some of them are similar to rodents. And um, it's just really important to take the time to try to figure out what it is that your problem is, because some of these species are actually really helpful. Others are a problem. Others aren't any big deal. Others are really rare, and so they um, need some protection. And I wish I had time to get into all of these, but I can only do a couple of them. So this is the something that you might see in the springtime. The hint is, if you look at it, you can see it's something that it's just not around during the day. They like to eat roots, things that are underground. In the summer or in the spring, when the snow disappears, all of a sudden you see all these networks of um, tunnels, the remains of tunnels. Anybody seen any of these? Do you know what they are? If they're voles that are very similar to mice, it's what you're saying that there's a problem with. So you do have a lot of options with voles. If you've got voles that are eating the, you know, off your, um, you know, chewing on the bark in the wintertime, you can pull all of the mulch and the grass away from the base of the tree and put a protective, um, like a swirly thing on there or something to protect the bark. But you can also stomp around with snowshoes and um, crush that snow space around the tree because they're living in the open space underneath the snow. In the summertime, sometimes these things just drive me crazy and I end up, I put um, the egg spray out. They don't like the egg spray, but I have many times trapped them. And the trick that I use for voles is that, um, you know, there's a small hole that I'll cut in a yogurt container and put a snap trap inside here. But I've only ever caught voles in these because apparently none of the other little rodents or shrews, none of the other little guys like to go inside there. So this has worked really well. My favorite trick for voles though that works, actually works in the wintertime too, is these sonic spikes. They're solar powered. There's a lot of different brands that um, sell them, but this is the only one I found that worked. And it's, it's the Mole Max Mole and Gopher Repeller, which is ironic because we don't have moles here and they don't seem to work on gophers, but they work great on voles. Don't get it confused with Mole Max Mole, mole and Vole Repellent. <laughs> it's kind of funny, you have repellers and repellent. And also you really need to look closely to make sure you use the one with the chatter sound technology. Because what this is, is it's a lot of the rodents that live underground, they let out a warning, you know, ee -ee 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 kind of sound. And so this mimics that sound, and it's underground, so it travels underground. So you need to put it in really thick, dense soil. My soil is super dense, so it works Do you great. need one of those for every tree, or? No, they, they um, my garden is pretty big, and I just have two that are spread out. Um. And what's crazy is you can hear them in the middle of the winter, even under a couple feet of snow. They recommend that you not leave them out in the winter. 
but I didn't get to them and I could hear them when I'm not harvesting my carrots. I can hear them going even under a couple feet of snow. Supposedly they'll go for three weeks after just one day of charge, but I love them. They didn't work for Lisa at all, but probably, possibly because one of her big problems is this creature, the northern pocket gopher, which has these funny little pouches in their cheeks and they're bigger than the voles. They also leave um, pathways that show when the snow melts out but um, I don't know a whole lot about these. They're pretty different. They're um, much fatter. They can even, they'll chew up your plants underground and they'll even chew up like cables. They cause a lot of problems. They, you can build little um, like fence structures underground, you know, bury a wire basket sort of around your plants and you can also try to trap them, but apparently you need to get rid of 70% of the population or more and they're just gonna stay at the same level. So I need, do need to talk a little about, about poisons, because often when we think about um, rodents, you know, we think about poisons. So the big thing is what's wrong with just poisoning the rodents. Well, there's a whole lot wrong with it. The big thing is that they're not selective. They'll kill whatever eats them. You think, well, I'm only putting it out for the mouse. Well, the mouse eats it, or if we're targeting, it could be the vole. The vole eats it. The vole doesn't feel very good, walks around really easy for an owl or a hawk to catch that bull, the mouse is still full of poison. You kill the, the owl or the, the hawk. Well, it could be your dog that eats that mouse. And the newer poisons now don't have any antidotes at all. And so they're anticoagulants, so they bleed to death and your vet can't do anything at all to help your dog. So it's, it's you have to be really, really careful if you're gonna use poisons. Um, the thing about traps is they're often not selective either, and so if you're gonna do trapping, you need to do something like protect other species from the traps, like put them underground or be real careful with where you put them. Um, Lisa's had great success with these black box things because apparently they only kill the um, pocket gophers. It's called a black hole. Black hole. Black box is a different product too. You can also use live traps, um, which work great, but you just have to be really careful that you are letting the animal go in a place where they're going to be able to get their needs met. So you don't want them to just starve to death somewhere else. You also don't want to just take them to your neighbor's house. <laughs> um, skunks, a quick word about skunks. Skunks are actually much more good than they are bad. They do a lot of good work for us. The thing about skunks though is obviously that they uh, can spray you so you don't want to keep them around your house so don't leave out any food or any attractants that are going to um, draw skunks to hang out near you. For years I've used these stinky um, old-fashioned mothballs. I throw maybe two or three under the barn every year, and it doesn't take very many. The skunks will leave right away. Neighbor calls and said, did you just get, chase your skunks off again? The skunk will go to the neighbors. But you have to be really careful because these are poisonous, and you want to make sure no kids or pets can, can get near them. So I also included on the handout this recipe for how to denature the protein that's in skunk spray, and I, this works 100%. So OK, now finally to the big troublemakers. Um, black bears and grizzly bears, definitely not critters that you want to have around, but you need to know that they are expected and they do exist everywhere in northwest Montana now. Um, we're getting more and more grizzly bears, so we're starting to see them. And it really doesn't, it's not that important anymore to tell which, or it never really was that important to know which species it is. What's important is to know what their motivations are, so I just treat them the same. Um, bears eat almost everything but it's almost entirely plants. They hardly ever eat meat at all, a little bit of meat. Mostly what they're doing though is from um, September on, they're at like that, like from huckleberry season on, all they're doing is eating because they have to store all the calories they can to get them to be able to sleep all winter long. So they're just eating and eating and eating and they're looking for any kind of food at all. So you really need to be careful about um, leaving out things that will attract bears to your um, property, and especially if it might give them a reward. Things like uh, garbage, animal food, pet food. If you leave out pet food, they could eat the pet food and the pet sometimes. Um, barbecues and uh, chickens, we'll get into some of that. But bird feeders are one of the biggest problems because it's a really high energy, packed, yummy source of calories right there. So the recommendation has always been only feed, in, only feed your birds in um, December, January, February, March, or out of reach 10 feet high and four feet out without any grain spill. That's been the recommendation for years. 
one or the other. But what we're finding is a lot of our grizzly bears are now hanging out, not a lot, a few are hanging out in the valley floor throughout December. So I'm gonna start, I'm not gonna start my feeding until January 1st from now on. It's disappointing. Hummingbird feeders are especially attractive because that's just sugar water. And the uh, point here is that don't think that a hummingbird won't, or a, a bear won't come to your hummingbird feeder just because it's so close to the house. Know that it's still a huge temptation. So I need to talk just a little bit about compost because Fish and Wildlife and Parks actually wishes that nobody composted in the valley because most people don't do it right. For years what I did was I would just throw all my goodies in there and I'm lucky I never had a bear or a scum. I did get scums in the compost but not bears. The uh, thing to do though to make it not so attractive is to cut it up really small before you take it out there and put it in the compost pile put in some of the browns, you know, some of the um, like dried manure or straw or, or dried grass or leaves, and mix it all up right away, spread it out. So you're not just throwing some, some yummies right on top. And then it breaks down much faster. It's not a big attractant. They've been learning for years about how to fence areas for bears, and they're finding that electric fencing is by far the best. And I, on that handout, I also have the um, the link for the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Bear Info page, and it has a link for this um, beginner's guide, which is full of information. The uh, Defenders of Wildlife will help you pay for your electric fence. If you're fencing off bear attractants, they'll pay up to, um, I think it's 50% of your fencing project, up to $500. But, but the web link is on the handout, too, and you want to contact them right away to get on their list. It's not hard to fence for bears. This is a you know, real simple fencing for orchard, for you know apples. And if you don't take care of it, you could end up with this, which is mama grizzly bear teaching her babies bad habits. A fed bear really is a dead bear, and it's, it's up to all of us to try not to ever let them get a reward. Something like this is incredibly tempting. Um, beehives, and fencing it isn't too hard to do. Solar electric fence. Chickens are another big thing that bears have learned about and they're teaching their babies. And even if you have a real solid structure, they can break into it. And electric fencing for chickens is pretty simple. And this is a picture of, um, see it down at the bottom there is a hen house that a grizzly bear had gotten into, ripped apart and killed some of the chickens. And you'll also notice one of Fish, Wildlife and Parks uh, bear traps there. And a lot of people don't want to call fish wildlife in parks. They don't want to admit that they made a mistake and accidentally fed the bears, but they're also afraid that the bears might get killed. But I can't tell you, it really is a good idea to call fish wildlife in parks. Usually what they're trying, hoping to do is to catch the bear, move it just far enough away so that they have time to help you solve the problem. Um, they also, they don't want you to call if you've just got a black bear walking in your yard. They already know they're there everywhere. What they do want us to do, though, is give them a call, but also try to scare off the bear if you can from a safe place. Be aggressive, you know, rest them a lot, be really noisy, and bang some pans together, and use bear spray. Real quick, through some other critters, are um, there's a lot of other mammalian critters that can get into your um, chickens, and the trick is just really good fencing and buried fencing is really important. Oh. There's um, several kinds of raptors and owls that will go after you, like that picture, that will go after your chickens. I, I've had chicken for years, chickens, and it's really discouraging when the predators get them. And the trick for them is just overhead fencing. It doesn't have to be as elaborate as this, but you do need something, some kind of netting. And chickens, they just plain require a capital investment. You can't just throw chickens in your backyard in northwest Montana. You've got to do something to protect them, and it protects bears. If you have other species, that you're worried about for your livestock. Um, I really can't give you a lot of help on that, but I do have some good web links on that and just call Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and they will help you out. Okay, now how to attract wildlife and enlist them to help you in your gardens and your yards and your farms. So there's a saying among um, wildlife biologists that habitat is where it's at, and that's true. There are three components of habitat, and if we're missing even one, the likelihood of a species being in that area is reduced to nearly zero. Each species has its own habitat requirements, but all species need food. This is a mountain bluebird eating a, a caterpillar larva. Um, all species need water. This is a tree swallow drinking water out of a lake. Um, shelter. This is critically important. 
all wildlife species need uh, protection from the weather and from predators. This is a black cap chickadee excavating a nest cavity. Um, on our farm, um, my husband and I, we own a farm in the valley. We have 20 acres. Um, so we really try to, and my husband's an organic farmer and I'm a biologist, and we try to complement each other by using tools to benefit both of us. I love all the birds, but I love really good food. But we do have some challenges. <clears throat> when we first moved to our farm, we started um, plowing some of the grass, and we, the first year we had horrible issues with army cutworm moth larva. Um, it, it was like a razor blade, just cut off the top of all the plants. Uh, flea beetles, they can really wreak havoc on your greens. Um, wireworms, last year we had a pretty bad issue with wireworms. Um, but um, there are things you can do, and um, cabbage moss. I love broccoli, but boy, there have been some years that we really had issues with green worms on broccoli. But if you encourage um, animals to help you, we also have chickens, and I have to keep them fenced up most of the time in the spring because they go and eat the seeds that we've just planted or the little seedlings, so they wreak havoc in the garden. But come late summer, early fall, I love to just open them up and let them free range all over our, like our four acre around the house area. Because we get grasshoppers really bad. And they love grasshoppers. So it's like, let them out, let them do the work, let them help us. But this is outside in the summer. But the one thing, if you look, we don't have any large trees or snags. A snag is a standing dead tree. And that's what is really important to provide um, shelter for a lot of the animals that help us. Almost all the animals that nest in a cavity, a cavity nester, are insectivores. So we do like work really hard to attract cavity nesters to our yard. And as a result, these are pictures of some of the food that my husband has grown. He's actually in the back corner here. <laughs> he spoils me with really good food. And the way we do that is that we put a lot of nest boxes up. We own 20 acres and we probably, he helps me, he builds these really great nest boxes. This is an example of what not to do. The overhang is not protected, this one is. And then the other thing that this has is a side door. Oh, did this good. You wanna be able to clean your nest boxes out every year. And also if you get some of the non-native bird species like starlings and English sparrows, you definitely want to open that up and get their nesting materials out. They really compete with our cavity nesting species and they don't really help us much. On the this is an example of a snake that um, uh, was used by cavity nesters. And the one thing you can see, the sapwood is still intact, but the inside has rotten out. And that is why cavity nesters key in on. But how do they make a cavity in those? Um, let me back up real quick. Um, in the other species, bats. So birds, the cavity nesters are insectivores, so they work all day eating insects. Um, tree swallows, when they are nesting, a single tree swallow can eat 2,000 insects a day. And then the sun sets, and what happens? The bats emerge, and they pick up where the birds left off. And it talks about how um, bats and birds can save the agricultural industry here in the United States billions of dollars annually. And the way that works is that farmers don't have to use as many pesticides, which is a win-win because pesticides aren't good for birds. It kills the insects but can also poison them. And also it can, it's a um, carcinogen, it can cause cancer. So shelter, this is a picture of a white-headed woodpecker when I did my graduate work in the Central Oregon Cascades. And I just love this little chick sticking its head out. Um, but so what's happening is the inside of this snag is enlarged. The parents can go in and excavate a cavity, but the sapwood is still real hard and intact, and it provides protection for both the predators and weather. Here's a black-capped chickadee. They will nest they, um, in a lot of different areas, but they are always looking for anything that's suitable. You can have a thousand dead trees out on a landscape, but it doesn't mean you have suitable nesting habitat. So what makes something suitable? So as trees age, um, they get decayed, and the pattern of decay determines the use by wildlife. This is a pileated woodpecker, and on the um, left, 
Those are foraging holes. They love their primary prey as carpenter ants, but on the right is a nesting cavity. So most trees rot from the outside in. Most fungi will feed on the sapwood and not affect the heart or the heartwood. But then sometimes you get trees like this. This is a cottonwood tree. It's still alive, but the top has died. And where I worked in central Idaho one year, there was a pair of kestrels, American kestrels, nesting in it. And the reason this tree was suitable is because it had heart rot. And heart rot, why is it so important? Heart rot is a fungus that only affects the heartwood. And only when the tree is alive, and it doesn't kill the tree. They can live hundreds of years old. If you ever go up to like Avalanche, um, uh, the Trail of the Cedars, huge trees, and a lot of those have heart rot, but they're hundreds of years old and they are still alive. But what happens, if you look here, um, this is the sapwood, the light color stuff, and this is the live tissue where all the water and the nutrients are carried up to the tree. But as the tree gets larger, that sapwood, the inner layer dies and becomes heartwood, and so it's no longer living. But if it's like we get a cut on our arm, if it has a broken branch, then the heart, heart rot fungi um, can go inside to the heartwood and it starts slowly decaying that. And that allows it to be softer, and that's what the woodpeckers key in on. So different tree species have different susceptibility to heart rot. In our area, all the deciduous trees, cottonwoods, aspen, aspen is like the most valuable wildlife tree you can really plant if you want to attract cavity nesters. Uh, birch trees, but also uh, tree species like western larch, they are very susceptible to heart rot and they can live hundreds of years with it. Um, by contrast, like um, Engelmann spruce, I've hardly ever seen an Engelmann spruce with heart rot. So the cavity nesters, this is a pileated woodpecker, a northern flicker, an American three-toed. These guys are considered keystone species. And what that means is that by their presence in an area, that allows for the presence of an abundance of other species and in great numbers. And they do that because they're the ones that can excavate these round holes in a snake. They go around and tap, and they can tell if it's hollow if the hardwood is softened. So that saves them an enormous amount of energy. They just have to excavate through the real hard sapwood. And then once they get to the uh, softened hardwood, it just goes so much faster. I worked on a woodpecker study, and once I got through the sapwood, it would just be a couple days that uh, they could finish those cavities. Um, the red nape sapsucker that Amy mentioned, this one we consider a double keystone species because it's also a primary cavity nester. And each of these birds makes a hole of a different size. So when they're finished nesting in it, the other species will come in of different sizes, like a small um, swallow, or I think you'll be surprised, even some of our ducks are cavity nesters and will nest in these cavities. But the other thing that these guys do, they'll have two or three trees that they create these sap wells on, and it's not just important for them. It's, there are over 20 other wildlife species that will feed on these sap wells, and it's really important for moths and butterflies, but especially important for our hummingbirds. When they first show up in spring, we have very few flowers that are in bloom, and it's because of these sap wells that the hummingbirds show up so early. That's what keeps them alive. Here are some of our secondary cavity nesters. So like a wood duck and the northern pig meow, they love the pileated size holes, which are four to six inches, or the northern flicker, which is two and a half to three inches. The upper right is a tree swallow. They'll use a hairy woodpecker or sapsucker hole. Mountain bluebirds, they like the um, hairy woodpecker or flicker size. And then there's a house wren. And the cool thing about these guys, most of them are insectivores or they feed on rodents or things that can negatively affect your gardening. And like I said, there are ducks. I just love this picture a friend of mine took. Um, and you, we want, this is an old pili, pileated hole. And so here this female nested in there is like 20 feet up. And then like all of a sudden they hatch and they all can leap out of there without getting injured. So you have something like this. If you have water nearby and have a snag or a tree, 
It's great to be able to leave them. So the best thing to do, you can sort of tell that this snag had been, been burnt, but it looks like it's cut at the top. So you don't want snags or trees with decay falling on your house or your garage or your car. So what, instead of cutting the whole thing down, top it to a safe height. Even if you have to top it to just eight feet high, the amount you, you'll enjoy years of wildlife watching by keeping something like that in your yard. But if you don't have that, think nest boxes. That's exactly, it's the same idea. The hard exterior shell and then the hollow um, inside. It provides protection from both predators and the weather. This is um, a project my husband and I did when our son was in first grade, and we went and made nest boxes with them. That was a hoot. I had no idea that kids didn't know how a tailor worked. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a learning experience. So um, when we moved to our farm, we had no snags or trees, and we own 20 acres, and we have 30 nest boxes that we have up on our farm. And it's just amazing. The name of our farm is Swallowcrest Farm because, I mean, we have so many swallows. We get uh, the tree swallows, violet green swallows, mountain bluebird, and western bluebirds all nesting in our nest boxes. And we pretty much just make the bluebird box, but the swallows we use this readily. But if you have stock animals, mainly cattle, horses too, they love to play with them, especially our steers with the horns, they'll just, and they'll just knock them off. So you always want to put them on the outside of the fence so those animals can't get them. The other thing, um, you always want to face that nest hole away from the predominant uh, weather. On our farm, most of our weather comes from the southwest. So we orient our nest holes um, facing east. And that seems to be really successful. The only exception is when we place them on buildings. This is on the north side of our house between our uh, bathroom and our bedroom window. And that nest box gets used every year by tree swallows. And it's just delightful, you know, to lay in bed in the morning and you can hear the baby start, you know, softly calling for food. It's a real soft, soft sounds and they, it really protects them because it's under the eaves of the house. This is um, a picture of going up our driveway and you can see how I've placed a whole bunch of nest boxes close. If I was just interested in bluebirds, this would be too close. But because we have four different cavity nesting species, we can get bluebirds here, a tree swallow here, and maybe a violet green swallow there. We also, because this is around our chicken house and we have lots of flies in the summer, I really want to use the birds to help me. So right there to the right of the barn, we have six more nest boxes on the fences right there. And we have years that we have probably 95% occupancy. If you're lucky enough to live near water and you want to put a, de a duck nest box up, there are um, instructions for the dimensions. But make sure you put one of those guards on because mink really like to feed on baby ducks. Here's a list of the cavity nesting birds in our area. And almost all of them are insectivores or feed on rodents. So it's really important to be able to encourage these. This doesn't even go into the mammals. Like all of our bats will nest in cavities. We have pine martens, we have flying squirrels, um, creatures like that. Um, if you have a forested area, a lot of people hate mistletoe, but mistletoe is actually really important for some of our mammal species. Um, pine martin like to rest den in those. Um, if it falls, uh, mistletoe clumps fall onto the ground in the winter, it's super nutritious for deer and they really like that. Um, <clears throat> species like um, the brown creeper, it doesn't nest in a cavity, but it will nest behind the sloughing bark of a tree, a large tree. And then hollow trees, look how many species use those. And the trees that completely get hollowed out, and the real big ones, the black bears love them, especially females with cubs, because the larger male black bears can't get in there. But be aware, on that handout are two species that we don't, that are cavity nesters, but we don't want to invite to nest on our land, and that's the European starling and the English sparrow. They're both non-native species, and they really are aggressive and outcompete our native birds. So what, that's why I have this here. If I see that English sparrows are nesting, taking up nesting in this, I'll go and just pull out all their nest materials and their eggs. 
Uh, the starlings need a larger hole, so if you're making a wood box or a wood duck nest box or a kestrel, that's when you get issues with them. Um, not all birds are cavity nesters, so there's a different type of shelter. With wildlife and shelter belt grows, um, like really thick, dense spruce trees. It's incredible cover, like especially with the windstorms we've been having. A lot of the birds will nest and uh, just seek cover in, in those kinds of trees. Um, in the bottom left are hybrid poplars. I, when we moved to our place, we didn't have trees planted around and I wanted some privacy and I wanted to provide for wildlife habitat. So I alternated um, with these hybrid poplars and then a native ponderosa, hybrid poplar, duck fir. And so now it's grown up and the hybrid poplars don't live real long and they're sort of dying back and the native trees are taking over. So I'll do a row of trees for like shelter and cover and then the next row will be like uh, anything that will provide food, like choke cherries and mountain ash. Um, raptors eat rodents and insects. Um, the American kestrel actually is not doing great throughout the United States. And there's a lot of um, uh, evidence to suggest that it's because so many pesticides are used. They also feed on grasshoppers, and we think that we're just sort of wiping out their food base and their secondary poisoning. But um, we encourage them in our area, and the best way to encourage these guys, because they all eat rodents, and we definitely have voles and um, pocket gophers. So what we do, or if you have the option, natural trees or snakes for perch sites, you want this like 30, 40 feet up. But um, years ago, when we first moved to our farm, we had above ground electricity, and then our power kept going out. And so they said, okay, we're gonna put your power underground. And I was out there, I'm like, well, what are you gonna do with power poles? And he's like, well, we're just gonna haul them off and you know, burn them or whatever. I said, well, can we keep them? And my dear husband put these dug holes for me and put them up and we have perch posts. And now if you go to the base of those, you're gonna just see owl pellets all over the place. And the falcons and the hawks use them too. And we see them out there hunting frequently. Okay, the other one, component that is critically important to wildlife is water. So if you don't have water on your farm or your land, um, you want to provide water. Um, when we first moved to our place, I just started feeding birds in the winter and I didn't have water. And I was amazed. Once I got water on the property year round, the number of birds that we would see throughout the year would probably tripled. So water is so important. And there's a way to do it through the winter too. And that's what you want to do, use a plastic container and then get one of these de-icers. And that keeps it um, available all winter. And the birds just love it. They'll even take baths in the winter. Um, they're all, the counter side of that is some cats um, are drawn to these areas where you feed. We have a cat at home that likes to kill birds, but he's a great uh, mouse catcher because we have a big barn. So I love having him around for that, but I had to take special precautions with him, and we've been there 22 years now. And um, so what I did, he used to come and just sit at the base of the bird bath, and the pine siskins aren't real quick, and he would just leap up and grab them. Like, well, that's not gonna work. So there are two things that I do. Um, he's not allowed out. Um, this isn't my cat, this is just a picture. When it's the bird breeding season, I keep him in during the day and only let him out at night because rodents are nocturnal, the birds are diurnal during the day. <clears throat> and if he does go out during the day, he's got to wear this collar. It's called Birds Be Safe. And, you know, the collars with the bells don't work very well. Birds are very visual. They see the colors. And these really help cut down on cats catching birds. The other thing we did is um, put a very flimsy fence, just like Amy was talking about, around the bird bath and bird feeder. And so the cat doesn't like to jump over that because it's like, like this. So that's really helped. Now the, the final component is food. So that's one thing that I do. We grow strawberries and raspberries. And they, you know, the birds eat some of those. Sometimes they really get the strawberries, don't they? But the, the key is picking them frequently. But we also plant uh, native species to provide food for them. Choke cherry, mountain ash, we have these all throughout the yard in the wildlife line. 
<clears throat> elderberries. These are um, cedar waxwings. Sarvisberry. And black hawthorn. Black hawthorn is really important because not only does it provide food source with the berries, but it has thorns on the trees and the birds love to nest in there because it affords them more protection. And then I don't always just do native plants. Um, I've learned that planting some non-native ones extends the season for uh, food and um, pollen on our property. Hyacinths, I love these guys because um, it's one of the first flowers to bloom in the uh, spring. Nothing else will be in bloom. And you know what really targets these are these bumblebees. We'll have 15 bumblebees on a stalk of hyacinth. And then rocket snapdragons. I love these guys. They're two and a half, three feet tall. They persist throughout the summer and fall. They can overwinter even though they're an annual. And the um, hummingbirds and moths and sphinx moths and butterflies just love them. And then Monarda. <laughs> I probably, in some places I have like pure Monarda gardens or bee balm. The hummingbirds, moths, and um, uh, hum uh, butterflies just love this. Comes in different colors so you can make these beautiful gardens with them. And then I don't always cut them down in the fall. And the reason I don't do that is um, I think the first time I did it is because I ran out of time. But I've learned that in the winter, the uh, goldfinches and the pine siskins love to come in and eat the seed. So I always let them um, overwinter. And then come spring, here's my cat with his Birds Be Safe collar on. He's in the wheelbarrow. But this is the old Menarda stem, so I'm harvesting them in the spring. So that's when I do it. Milkweed's a really important um, plant that you can put in your garden to attract butterflies, hummingbirds. <clears throat> Penstemon and salvia, any tubular flower will attract the hummingbirds. When we first started living at our place, I think we'd see like one or two hummingbirds in the yard. And I do use feeders also. I have three feeders all up high in three different locations. But now there are times that we can count at least 30 hummingbirds in the yard. And a hummingbird researcher told me for every hummingbird that you see, there probably are 10 more in the yard. But I think a lot of it is they've learned when they're on their, migra on their migration that our house is now a stopover. Because I get them out early and we'll have times where we'll have 30 in the yard. We don't have that many nesting in the yard, but now we have three different species that nest in our yard, and we have just built that up over time. Um, for, you can do plant cover crops. This is sweet clover. It's really important for um, green manure, for, and then also for the pollinators. Um, like, Julian will plant like Siberian peas, which has a flower, and that, once it's a certain um, age, he'll disc it in and it adds nitrogen to the soil, and meantime, and, uh, provides food for a lot of our pollinators. Um, pollinator, pollinators are important. So we, I plant a lot of flowers, but then in turn they go and they pollinate our apples, our pears, our plums. And boy, there are days you walk out in the yards and the apple trees are just covered with the kinds of bees and flies. Um, here's Julian with, we used to have um, honeybees these are non-native bees, but you know, they're really important pollinators. And then there are native bees, mason bees. These guys don't sting. Um, the females can, but um, these are things you want to encourage to have in your yard as pollinators. And this is an example of one of our apple trees one year. It's just like, oh my gosh. I, sometimes I have trouble when the branches break. I'm still trying to fine tune my pruning, but um, we have a lot of good pollinators in the yard. Um, when we first moved to our farm, I never saw swallowtail butterflies, and let alone a larva. And I think it was four years in that I saw my first uh, larva of a swallowtail crawling across the grass. And I was like, wow, success. We're getting there. So just slowly built it up. Sphinx moths, have you guys ever seen these? They come out at dusk. They look like a hummingbird. That's a nickname for them, a hummingbird moth. They love this Monarda, and they're just fascinating. And don't forget about the little guys, garter snakes. 
On my wildlife line, I used to mow it, and now we don't because we've learned that that provides really important cover for the garter snakes. And they eat, you know, all kinds of insects and even small mice, long-toed salamanders. Um, Amy has western toads in her garden. We don't. We're a little drier. But um, she provides these uh, half rounds of bark, and she said that the toads <coughs> love to use them. If you have a slug problem, you want toads in your garden. They'll eat them. And don't forget about some of the mammals. A lot of the mammals have a really bad rap, you know, coyotes. You know, I always hear people wanting to shoot them, but you got to remember, they are the ones that are going to eat those ground squirrels and those pocket gophers. You want them out there. Uh, Short-tailed weasels, ermine, and besides, they're super cool to see. <laughs> one of the, the um, I think one of the best strategies there are to figure out what you can do to help enlist wildlife help, wildlife help, as well as to solve some problems is, like we said before, to try to learn as much as you can. And this website, it's um, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and the, it's Montana Natural Heritage Program has this um, animal field guide and the website is on the handout and it's just an amazing array of information it's a great thing to use for identification and for learning about them so that you can kind of think about the, like the problem or the solution you can think about it from their mindset you know is it cover that they're coming for or water or just to learn as much as you can there's lots and lots of information out there um, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has all these living with brochures I have some in the back but um, I also have a link for the whole set of them is on the um, hand, uh, handout, and same with these other two documents that are just full of information. Our handout, make sure you grab one on your way out because it's got the recipes in there. <coughs> and um, we hope that uh, we've convinced you to work with instead of against wildlife. And I really like you know thinking about wildlife as part of our community um, food system, which was the theme of this year's workshop as wildlife are an essential part of that. And the reality I see is somewhere between these two. It's not a battleground. I don't really see it as a you know magical system either because there's some struggle, but you know it's a kind of find a way to work to, to live together. The reality is somewhere in between there. Wildlife enrich our lives, diversity and wildness and they're they're vital for a resilient world. So any help with magpies eating all of your sweet cherries? Is there do hanging things help? Yeah, the, 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 the ball Blue thing, jays. the eyes. The yeah. They oh, eat jays. all our sweet wow. cherries. Okay. For sweet 20, cherries, just they come and they, then they go when the cherries are gone. You know, is there anything you hang? Do I do the CDs and the pie? I'll try like shiny CDs. pie pie plates, pie plates, and I mean just go for a mix so of all smart. kinds of things. I'm planning to. Um, Put one of those owl, you know, that fake owl thing that I showed that, that the boy held. I'm going to put some of those in the trees, too. Yeah. Okay, I think we're, we're all done. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah.